Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's Children's Health Council panel. Thank you so much for joining us on this very rainy day. Uh, my name is Christina Truesdale, and I am the chair of the Children's Health Council. In recent weeks, we have learned that the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine will still soon become available to children age five to 11 years old. I think many parents on this call today are very excited with this recent development, but it does leave us with a lot of questions. And the most important question of all is, is this vaccine safe for young children? At Wall Cornell Medicine, it is our privilege and honor to have a national expert in pedi pediatric vaccine development leading the Department of Pediatrics. Dr. Sally Permar is the Nancy C. Paduano Professor of Pediatrics and a world-renowned physician scientist. Her lab focuses on developing vaccines to prevent mother-to-child transmission of viruses like HIV and CMV, which is the leading cause of birth defects in newborns. During the pandemic, Dr. Permar's lab has been at the forefront of the fight against COVID-19. We are fortunate to have her here today to discuss COVID-19 vaccines for kids. After a brief presentation, Dr. Permar will be joined by Dr. Virginia Pasquale, the Drucker Director of the Gale and Ira Institute for Children's Health to answer our questions. The conversation will be moderated by Dr. Emily Wasserman, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and Specialist in Pediatric Critical Care. Thank you so much to these incredible speakers for your time today. Before we kick things off, I would like to highlight that this is a very special time for Wild Cornell Medicine, as we recently launched a $1.5 billion fundraising campaign to advance our institutional mission to care, discover, and teach. The We're Changing Medicine campaign is putting children's health at the forefront of this advancement in medicine in order to give children across the globe a positive future. Many of you here have generously supported children's health at Wall Cornell, and we thank you so much. I hope everyone attending today will be inspired to join our efforts to change the future of medicine, and especially children's health. To learn, to learn more, please visit that campaign website, which will be linked in the group chat. And now, Dr. Permar, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Christina, and thank you to all of our Children's Health Council members and um, those that are all thinking about how we can uh, best keep our children safe during this time and uh, for all of their years. Um, we uh, have some exciting things going on in the department to tell you about. Um, the first is uh, one of our biggest priorities as a department has been addressing health inequities. And I'm proud to report that we have an, uh, come to an agreement between our physician organization and our health system to have an integrated pediatric subspecialty clinic that will open in January. Um, we previously were seeing our subspecialty patients in two separate care settings, one for Medicaid funded um, uh, patients and one for commercial uh, insured patients. And we are now gonna bring those two clinics together. And so our doctors, our trainees, um, and uh, our patients and families are excited for this opportunity. Also wanna tell you about an exciting recruitment that we have um, finished. We have a, um, a leader in the world of pediatric vaccines and immunology and infections, um, Dr. Jenny Fuda, who will be joining us from Duke University. She uh, is a black female scientist who holds a number of NIH grants in the area of children's vaccine responses and immunology. And um, she will also serve as the assistant dean of faculty aiding in the diversity of our basic science faculty, um, both at the institutional level and uh, as a research mentor for our basic science faculty in the department. Um, we also launched our physician scientist training program. Uh, the recruitment season has begun, and I'm proud to report that of two slots that we opened that will be for residents who integrate research, we have had 80 applicants across the nation, and we have doubled our number of MD-PhDs applying to our pediatric residency. And finally, with the uh, 
the Drucker Institute, we have launched a recruitment of junior faculty who are focusing on children's research. So a lot going on in the department, and um, we really um, thank you for all of your support that makes this all possible. Um, I'll turn now to a presentation on the latest with the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, especially with the pending approval for the 5 to 11-year-olds which many of you, including myself, you know, have a member of that category uh, in your household. Um, so next slide. So first, just to look at where are we today in terms of the pandemic and children. So as of um, last week, over 6 million US children have been positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, you can see the trajectory of pediatric infections well, initially, probably there were many more infections that we did not even test for because we did not have adequate testing. It became clear that children were a major uh, source of the infections and a major um, a group that was being affected by, by this virus um, in the surge over the winter months. And then most recently with the Delta variant over the summer becoming the dominant strain and the case number rising, children became 25% of all of the COVID-19 uh, infections that were being reported. Next slide. And with that was a rise in the number of hospitalizations. So at one point during the summer, we had over 350 children per day that were admitted to the hospital throughout the nation um, with this infection. And notably, there have been over 400 deaths from this virus in children. Um, and so this is a, a deadly and uh, severe virus infection for children that we're proud to, to now be able to offer them the vaccine very, very soon. Next slide. One of the very key uh, components of the severity of the infection in children has been an inflammatory syndrome that can follow the infection in children. The um, MISC or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Over 5,000 cases of MISC has been reported um, nationally, and it works out to somewhere between 1 and 3,200 infections in children that lead to this severe syndrome. Importantly, uh, almost half of those cases have been in the age group that's uh, included in the next vaccine approval, that age 6 to 11 group. Um, and so this um, MISC is something that um, clearly has um, a uh, predilection for that age group. And then importantly, in terms of health disparities, this is also um, a disease that is overrepresented in Hispanic and Black communities, um, which also uh, contributes to the health disparities noted for COVID-19. We um, at Weill Cornell are leading in the research around this area um, through Virginia Pasquale's work and Emily Wasserman, who you'll hear from today. Um, and so we are learning more about this disease all the time, but put this also in the category of diseases that will be prevented with the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Next slide. And then, of course, we all experience this, the impact of the secondary pandemic on children, the learning loss from schools being out last year, the mental health crisis that the American Academy of Pediatrics has just called a state of emergency in terms of the mental health crisis in children and the um, depression and, and suicidality that has resulted from the social isolation. Um, obesity rates have increased, food insecurity and child neglect, neglect and abuse have all increased and something that we realize how important it is for children to have their social networks in schools. Next slide. So far, we have been managing without the benefit of vaccine immunity in children under age 12. Um, we have uh, had a numerous studies that have gone forward, including some that, that we have, have helped lead, that masking is very effective in schools. Um, when masking is in place, the secondary attack rates from a case of SARS-CoV-2 that appears in the school is less than 1%, whereas if there are no uh, masks in place, that transmission rate can be up to 30%. And so the masking was clearly an important tool uh, this year and as children went back to school. Um, the distancing is ideal, but should not limit their, their learning um, and, so, and choose outdoors when possible. So many of us still have children that eat outdoors, um, even when it's raining and, and, and when it's cold. And, and that's uh, because of knowing how outdoors can be protective. Um, hand washing and respiratory etiquette is something we are pushing in our schools and that will help with every virus that we deal with um, in, as parents and as, uh, in our schools. 
And then um, getting tested early if symptomatic. Many of you, including myself, have probably um, had to deal with the routine cold that has come across in your children this, these years, this, uh, this season. And if um, uh, having symptoms right now, they're required to have a PCR test or COVID-19 before going back to school per um, the State Department of Health. We have worked together with the State Department of Health to um, see if the antigen tests can be um, substituted with the PCR test and those policies are being reviewed now. So there may be more testing opportunities available um, in the near future. Next slide. But the best defense of all is the COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, these vaccines have been just abundantly successful in the adult and adolescent population. And really it boils down to three diseases that are now vaccine preventable because of this vaccine. Um, so severe COVID-19 respiratory disease that is more common in adults, um, but also seen in uh, high risk children as well as um, our adolescent population that can land children in the ICU for respiratory disease. MISC that I talked about is another disease that this vaccine will prevent. And we do see children affected by long COVID or the months of time after a COVID infection in which an individual does not fully gain back all of their um, ability to uh, perform their daily activities as before the infection. Um, things like uh, feeling long-term fatigue, feeling long-term shortness of breath, um, feeling uh, depression and um, some neurologic symptoms that, that persist. Um, all of these three conditions are actually now vaccine preventable and we're about to be able to provide that protection and pre prevention to our children down to age five. Next slide. From the beginning um, here at Wild Cornell and our work has recognized that children would be key to the, the response at the end game of this pandemic. And I think that's really playing out in that uh, we, are, we are still ongoing in dealing with this pandemic until we have immunity in all of our populations and, and children is where um, the biggest gaps remain. Next slide. And there are huge advantages of pediatric immunization, um, and uh, one of which is differences in the pediatric immune system compared to adult immune system. So we've recognized through other studies, um, including HIV and cytomegalovirus that we study, that a child's antibody response can be uh, higher, more durable, and can respond to lower doses of a vaccine compared to adult immune systems. And this is a true advantage of, of the pediatric immune system and something that we can utilize in going forward with this vaccine and other new vaccines to place a, um, a vaccine in the time schedule for a pediatric immune um, uh, immunization schedule that um, elicits the best response that may actually end up being a lifelong protective response. We have that example through our hepatitis B vaccines that are provided around delivery and in the first months of life to children. And that actually provides lifelong immunity. And that's uh, the, the goal that we're seeking to achieve is, is providing lifelong protection from deadly diseases. Next slide. So some of the preclinical groundwork that we led that helped to establish the ability to use the mRNA vaccines for SARS-CoV-2 in children um, is, was led uh, by our group here at, at, at Weill Cornell. Um, early on, we worked with Moderna and the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH to test these vaccines in preclinical models, animal models. So here we used infant rhesus monkeys in order to have a, an animal model that was most similar to an infant um, in terms of their uh, immune system, their development, their safety profile. And we uh, worked to um, devise a study comparing the mRNA vaccine to that of a protein-based vaccine. We gave a two-dose regimen that was four months apart to two-month-old non-human primates and followed them up for a full year. Next slide. This is the neutralizing antibody responses that were elicited from both vaccines. And what's really notable um, from both the mRNA vaccine in red and the, the protein-based um, SARS-CoV-2 spike protein vaccine in blue is how durable that immune response was. So there was very little waning of the immune response during 
the time of the, uh, the study. And interestingly, something that we recognized is that um, at the beginning of the study, so around that uh, week zero time point, there was a little bit of neutralizing antibodies that were detected. And this is likely the maternal antibodies that are passed on to the baby. And um, circulating coronaviruses are also present in our non-human primate populations. And that um, uh, demonstrates that even though you may have some background neutralization that is acquired from the mom before vaccination, these babies could still respond very well to this vaccine. Next slide. An important um, recognition that we had is that a lower dose of the vaccine could elicit the same level of responses that was being achieved in adults and in, in, in human adults. So this really uh, led to the idea that a pediatric vaccine could be given at a lower dose, which would have a, have a better safety profile going forward. So in our studies, we used a vaccine dose of 30 micrograms, um, whereas the adult studies at that time were being done with 100 micrograms. And what we found is that the babies outcompeted the um, adults in responding to this vaccine, even when given at a lower dose. And that was exciting that the same pattern emerged as we had seen in our HIV vaccine studies really emerged with the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine as well. Next slide. So these studies are actually ongoing. Um, we've been following these uh, animals to long-term durability of their responses, and also looking at the efficacy of the responses against different variants. Um, as we know, most recently, the Delta variant becoming dominant. And we've actually recently challenged these um, animals with the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine to see how protected they are um, a year after the vaccine and with a different variant than what the, the vaccine was designed against. Next slide. So, but now getting to the human data, um, importantly, there have been almost 9 million adolescents that have been vaccinated against COVID-19, and this is as of July. Um, that's a huge number, and, and that gives us a huge uh, opportunity to view the safety and, um, and how well it's working. Next slide. So um, from what we know uh, from the studies that went forward in children, so um, Luckily, Pfizer designed their initial trials to include down to age 16. And so of the age 16 plus, the vaccine has been 95% effective in trials against um, preventing uh, symptomatic infection. In 12 to 15 year olds, the studies showed that it was 100% effective there with over 2000 um, individuals being um, uh, included in the vaccines. And there were 18 cases in a placebo group versus zero in a vaccinated group showing 100% effectiveness. The um, uh, vaccines, as you have likely heard, have been extremely effective against preventing hospitalization from SARS-CoV-2. Um, there is 100% effectiveness in the studies of age 16 um, to, to 18 age group. And then in the 12 to 15 group, there have been no severe cases of COVID-19 in trial participants. The, uh, the um, total real world uh, numbers against all age groups um, of the vaccine being protective against hospitalization from COVID-19 is around 89%. So again, a huge win for this vaccine, even though we know that breakthrough infections are happening, people are in general not being hospitalized when they do get that um, breakthrough infection. Next slide. With, with all of the nearly 9 million vaccines going forward in adolescence, we've also had a lot of opportunity to look at safety. Um, there is a um, adverse reporting system, adverse event reporting system that the CDC has in place called the VAERS reporting system. Um, there have been over 9,000 reports received. 90% um, of those have been non-serious events, things like dizziness, syncope, which means fainting, um, and headaches have been the things that have been reported. And we know that there are um, those side effects that, that are self-limited and last for about a day after the vaccine. Um, however, um, of note, there has been um, some serious adverse events, and, and this I know is on the mind of many of you, um, that, um, that uh, reports of these serious adverse events have all been consistent with myocarditis. And one important question is, what is myocarditis and, and, and what is the risk um, with the vaccine in comparison to the risk of um, getting the virus itself? So myocarditis indicates that there is inflammation around the heart muscle. The way a child would present with this type of, um, of condition would be complaining about chest pain, um, not feeling well in general, um, but, but you know, the, the major uh, symptom that, that would be uh, different than the typical just not feeling well is, um, is chest pain. 
Um, this is clearly a, um, a side effect of the vaccine that has been more common in younger individuals and male uh, younger individuals. Um, and importantly, though, it remains a rare event. So somewhere in the range of 12 to, to maybe up to 20, the reports are still coming out per 1 million doses um, in adolescents after that second dose of the vaccine. So, so that is the rate that's being reported. Though we as physicians, we really have compared this um, condition to what can happen with the infection itself. Um, importantly, myocarditis is an important um, uh, syndrome that can occur with COVID-19. And the COVID-19 related risk of myocarditis is somewhere six times higher than that of getting the vaccine. And um, it is also importantly, much more severe in the case of a, vac a virus associated myocarditis compared to the vaccine associated myocarditis. We'll talk a lot more about the myocarditis, but in general, the vaccine associated myocarditis has been self-limited, has been has resolved without treatment. Children who are admitted um, to our ICUs for monitoring, they walk out the next day. Um, when someone comes with a myocarditis associated with a virus, that is a very severe condition that requires life-saving interventions, um, requires a lot of, um, of drug treatment and um, often intubation and even um, a uh, system to, to pump blood for the heart. And that has not happened with the vaccine. So we'll talk more about the myocarditis as I know that's on the mind of many of you. But we as physicians recognize that it's much more important to prevent the, the virus associated myocarditis um, than um, the, the small chance that there would be a vaccine associated self-limited myocarditis. Next slide. So now uh, this weekend um, on Friday became available the data from the five to 11 year old trials from, from Pfizer. And looking at both the safety and efficacy, it's very reassuring and very um, actually exciting to, to be able to offer this um, protection to our children. In the first phase of the study, they did um, uh, look at dosing of the vaccine and determined that even lower than the dose we were using in the animal models, we could they could go down to a dose of 10 micrograms as opposed to 30 micrograms that um, has been given for the Pfizer adult dose, um, would elicit the same level of immune response as compared to adults. And it was associated with lower reactogenicity, lower uh, numbers of, of children would go on to have fever or headaches or uh, severe muscle pain from the where the vaccine was given. So all of those things was a real win for precision vaccine development in, in really designing a dose that was that was specifically for that age group. They then went on to a larger trial, uh, which is uh, referred to as a phase two or two to three, where they enrolled a two to one rate of over 1500 vaccinees between the ages of five and 11 and 750 received a placebo. The safety profile was extremely positive. The adverse events um, were similar between the placebo group and the vaccine group, which is always the best test that a randomly um, uh, assigned group of children who got either salt water versus the vaccine, they reported the same number of adverse events afterwards. And importantly, there were no serious events. There were no cases of myocarditis in this study um, with over 1,500 getting the, the vaccine. And there was also, importantly, no anaphylaxis or severe allergies. Um, and, and this, because this has also been a concern with, with the vaccine initially, um, showing that some people can have an allergic reaction. That was not seen in this, in this uh, study. And then importantly, the efficacy was very strong in this study, and that's what the graph represents. Um, in red is the number of cases that were acquired by the um, placebo recipients, and in blue, the cases that were acquired by the vaccine recipients. And you can see um, the difference that, um, that is uh, very evident. The efficacy was 91%. Um, where um, there were three cases of the, vac of the virus um, being acquired in the vaccine group versus 17 cases in the placebo group. Um, at least one of those cases in the vaccine group was before full immunity was achieved two weeks after the second dose. And importantly, those uh, cases that did happen in the vaccine group, they were much more mild in symptoms compared to um, the placebo group. And there were no cases of severe COVID-19 in the vaccine group. Next slide. 
And so importantly, we now uh, have to uh, work together um, as parents, as providers, as health advocates for children um, to uh, get these vaccine numbers up. Um, so right now, our uh, less than 12 year olds um, have not yet been vaccinated, and that's the group we're going to be focused on. The 12 to 15 year olds, though, are not um, at the vaccine rates that that are needed to really prevent the, the virus from um, being spread in our schools and children still um, becoming sick with the infection. So our 12 to 15 year olds in the US are somewhere around 50%. Our 16 to 17 year olds are not much higher, around 56%. And that um, young adult group has also lagged in terms of um, the vaccine rates. Um, importantly, you can co-administer the um, COVID-19 vaccine with all of the other vaccines, which right now we're very focused on flu, um, preparing for the flu season that um, is upon us um, with, with the flu vaccine. And so that's an important um, uh, recognition that those vaccines can be given together to increase the convenience of getting them both at the same time. Next slide. So um, we do need to increase the uptake of vaccines for children um, in our adolescent groups and then beginning in our five to 11 year old groups. Um, important ways of doing this is uh, making vaccine easy, uh, on-site vaccine events. And I'm happy to let you know that we will be having a um, vaccine site that's open to children at the Belfer building at Wild Cornell and in all of our clinics. Um, but on-site vaccine events with schools is one way to increase the uptake. Education and earning trust um, with, with messengers and info sessions and, and um, answering questions is an important way to increase the uptake of the vaccines. And then the, the um, role of employment and vaccine mandates is also important. We just rolled out our vaccine mandate here at Wild Cornell and at New York Presbyterian with much success, had very few individuals who work in our um, institutions that uh, remain unvaccinated. And so, so these are important ways to, to up increase the uptake as well. And then um, getting uh, people around our young children. We will still have a segment of our uh, child, child, childhood population that will not be yet eligible, the less than five-year-olds. And getting as many people around those children vaccinated as possible is the way to keep them safe um, and keep their schools and daycares open. Next slide. So what's up next for um, the COVID-19 vaccine? Um, the uh, five to 11 year old data from Pfizer was submitted, um, is gonna be reviewed at the end of this week actually by the FDA. It's expected that it will be approved uh, on an EUA um, basis. And then the, um, the CDC will be meeting the following week to recommend the vaccine. Um, excitingly, the vaccine vials that have to be different for this age group since they, it is a different dose are being pre-shipped ahead of the approval so that that vaccine will be available on November 2nd maybe November 3rd, depending on when we get the CDC's um, recommendations to, to move forward. And so uh, we're planning for those dates in Belfer building as well. The six months to five year data is ongoing with, and studies are ongoing with Pfizer. We don't have a timeline for those submissions yet. Um, Moderna is not too far behind in their five to 11 year old data. They do have their um, 12 to 15 year old data submitted. But um, importantly, we don't know if the FDA will move forward with an EUA for more than one vaccine um, uh, while the Pfizer has already been approved. And so one question that we get is, should people wait for the approval of a Moderna vaccine or other vaccine? And, and the answer is really no, because we don't have a timeline for when the approval will happen for another vaccine. Now that there's plenty of availability of the Pfizer vaccine, the FDA may not give out another EUA um, because uh, EUAs are supposed to be given really on an emergency basis and when another alternative does not exist. Um, Moderna is also going down to the six month age group with their studies and Johnson & Johnson has planned studies. So next slide. I wanna thank all of the, um, the uh, collaborators that we work with that got a lot of the early work done that helped with this vaccine approval down to uh, age five um, from UC Davis, from University of North, um, North Carolina, Chapel Hill and Duke, also at the VRC Vaccine Research Center at the NIH and Moderna and uh, uh, 3M is another one of our collaborators on the uh, vaccine side. And the Children's Health Council who uh, again helps us keep our research pipelines very full of um, uh, physician scientists and other researchers that can move forward this type of work. And I think I just have uh, one more um, slide to, to thank you and thank all of the, um, the supporters for, for this, getting this meeting together to allow me to give you some of this information. So I'll turn it over now to 
uh, Emily Wasserman, who is um, the uh, Children's Health awardee this year for her research. Um, she is a PICU trained physician scientist, um, so works in the pediatric ICU with some of our sickest patients, including those that have been affected with SARS-CoV-2. She is working closely with Dr. Virginia Pasquale and her research in particular in the MASC disease that's associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection. And really, um, she is one of the hopes for the next generation of physician scientists that will fight not only this pandemic, but those that come after and um, make us more ready for um, the types of diseases that uh, our children are, um, are being affected by. Emily. Thank you so much, Dr. Pramar. That's an incredibly flattering intro. I appreciate it. Um, and thrilled and honored to be hosting, um, to be moderating, sorry, this, um, this discussion today. It's an incredibly timely discussion and one that's incredibly meaningful, meaningful for me personally. Um, gives me the opportunity to probe the brains of my two uh, mentors. I'm a huge fan. And um, as a mom, a uh, sleep deprived mom this morning, um, of a rambunctious two-year-old, I am wrestling with a lot of the same questions uh, that I know our audience is as we prepare uh, for a vaccine approval. So I'm, I'm very eager to hear from both of you as we run through um, our discussion today. Uh, so thank you. Let me just also introduce our other discussant. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, which is, no, I, I turned it over to you, but uh, Virginia also is on. So Dr. Virginia Pasquale is the director of our um, Drucker Institute for Children's Health Research. Uh, she is a leader in terms of the um, uh, autoimmune response and diseases associated with inflammation and, and autoimmunity, such as lupus. She has also become a world leader in terms of the uh, response to the SARS-CoV-2 infection in children, in particular in the uh, MISC um, disease and understanding why that happens, how we can better prevent it, and how we can prevent the same type of inflammation in other infections. And so we're super lucky to have uh, Dr. Pasquale here to lead the discussion with me in terms of the vaccine safety and um, you know, potential risk and benefits for our children. Thank you, Dr. Pasquale. <laughs> Thank you for that very nice introduction. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here. And back to you, Dr. Wasserman. Um, we're thrilled you're both here. Um, so for the audience today, we're going to spend the rest of the hour um, just running through some questions. We'll start with some that we received in advance. Um, and then as we go through the conversation, feel free to submit your questions um, into the Zoom chat feature, which we'll address uh, towards the end. Um, so why don't we get started? Uh, I think Dr. Parmer did a great job sort of laying the landscape um, for where we are with the vaccines and uh, data on COVID-19 children. I think we we'll just want to sort of start off the conversation by talking about the rationale and why, why do we need to vaccinate our younger kids against COVID-19? I can start maybe there that um, it is a question that I hear often because it is a disease that we know affects adults and older individuals more severely and more frequently um, has uh, severely impacts our adult and, and elderly populations. Um, but as pediatric providers and as providers who work at a center that uh, complex patients are referred to, we know that um, very severe it, disease and impacts can uh, be seen in children. And um, we have seen over 100 children with SARS-CoV-2 infection in our ICUs in, during the last year. And um, there have been as many deaths from this virus in children as were um, occurring in the chickenpox, from chickenpox before there was a vaccine for that. So that's a vaccine where we all recognize the importance of vaccinating our children and it has become a routine vaccine that had um, even uh, less of an impact on children previously. Um, it's been more deadly and more common than the flu in our um, childhood populations as well. And so this is an important reason that um, this vaccine will provide protection against what can be a deadly virus and um, it can uh, also leave lasting impacts, things like the MISC disease and long COVID. Um, finally, children are a chain of transmission for this virus as well. And um, even though you know, we can protect them against transmission often with masking in schools, but when they come home, they're also um, uh, 
they can spread the virus to individuals in the household and especially um, those that still remain vulnerable when they have things like auto autoimmune diseases or um, immune suppressive conditions. Dr. Pasquale. No, I completely agree. And especially if, um, the last remark that Sally made is very important for me as a the pediatric rheumatologist, uh, taking care for many years of children who have autoimmune diseases and need to take immune suppressive medications. So it is becoming very clear that patients with immune mediated diseases and immune suppression, for example, do not develop the right levels of antibody protection in response to either the infection or the vaccine. So um, protecting these children is very important and vaccinating healthy children is a way to stop the spreading and, and protect these, these other populations who, uh, again, their immune systems cannot mount the right response. Thank you. And I, I think as parents, so much as of what we do is sort of weighing the risk benefit of our decisions. And, and we've sort of talked through some of the risk and as an intensivist, I've seen them up close. So I, I just want to spend a little bit more time, particularly on the entity of Miss C, which is, as we know, is a particular interest to Dr. Pasquale and myself. Um, Dr. Pasquale can talk, like thinking about Miss C, I know we've had about 5,000 cases across the country, um, but the CDC has reported, especially over the summer, that the cases are actually rising. Is, is this the case? Why is it so? And and I, and I know the answer to this, but do we know what makes children, some children more vulnerable to this entity? Yes, this is definitely a, um, a very serious complication of exposure to, to SARS-CoV-2 virus, as all of you know. Uh, there are over 5,000 cases reported as of the beginning of October this year, whereas there were 1,000 cases reported in October of last year. So obviously it looks like the uh, incidence is, uh, the prevalence is in, are increasing, uh, but we don't know why. Uh, unfortunately, uh, even though there is a lot of research going on, as you, Emily and Sally know very well, not only in the US, but in Europe as well, um, we really don't know what predisposes certain children to developing this very, uh, exuberant inflammatory syndrome. So we know that it affects uh, more, as Sally already mentioned, children around nine, 10 years old, even though it can affect younger and older, obviously. Uh, we know that for the most part, um, the good news is that we know how to treat these children, but why are they more predisposed? We do not understand that part yet. We are uh, conducting a lot of research it looks like for kids who have been exposed to the virus and eventually weeks later develop this multisystem inflammatory syndrome, there might be a predisposition of the virus to, uh, or of the immune response to maybe uh, localize itself in the gastrointestinal system, in the gut, and uh, there is some gut lining damage that is what might be triggering an immune response um, in a very peculiar way um, with the production of inflammatory molecules that drive this uh, serious complication of exposure to the virus. This is some of the information that is coming. It's by no, but it doesn't mean by, by any means that it is going to be the a uh, reason why kids develop MISC, why these kids are not later in life, the virus might find or might uh, decide to, to stay in the gut rather than in other organs. So we really don't understand that part. There might be some genetic predisposition to develop this syndrome, although it's not clear either, because it's almost unheard of to see siblings with the syndrome. Uh, but, you know, I think that pediatricians, we are used to this kind of mysterious uh, complications of viral infections. We all have heard of the uh, Kawasaki disease, an inflammatory syndrome, also very exuberant, that affects also the heart, among other things, among other organs, and that we 
um, believe is caused also by a previous viral infection. Many years of research have not uh, been able to tell us for sure what might be going on there, but I can tell you that um, the scientific community, the pediatric scientific community is so uh, involved in trying to understand uh, MISC in children. So I am very confident that we eventually, and by we I mean us who are, going, are doing the research, but the entire scientific community working on this, we are going to find some clues that will be very useful for understanding COVID-19 and hopefully the next virus that will come and will also give rise to these peculiar responses in children. This is why it's great to have Dr. Pa Dr. Pasquale as a mentor. She ends always ends with optimism. <laughs> um, because this it is, you know, the hearing about Missy, seeing Missy, it's an entity that is fairly rare but very serious. And that's kind of the the summary of what COVID-19 is like for children. Rare but serious. And that's that's a hard reality, I think, to sit with as a parent. Again, going back to that risk benefit the risk of not vaccinating and, and the potential exposure to the virus and illness from the virus. Um, but then also weighing what are the risks of the vaccine themselves. And I think Dr. Permar talked a little bit about this, um, but I'd like for us to spend some time on the risks of the, the known and unknown risks of the vaccine. Um, and obviously we're gonna have to spend some time on myocarditis because that's the big one. So I can, start there that um, it is um, a risk benefit analysis. And I think, you know, as a parent, we're, we're doing that often. Um, and so that's why we have spent a lot of time trying to tease that out. What What is the risk of the, um, of the side effect we know to exist um, with the vaccine at the dose given to the adolescents and adults? Um, we don't yet know what the potential incidence or risk of that um, same complication is in the uh, younger age group, the five to 11 year olds at the lower dose, because the chances are the risk will be lower with the lower dose. And that's yet to be seen. Um, no, no cases came out in the, um, in the trial, which was around 1500 children, but, but that's a good start. Um, so, you know, it is a, a, a calculation of risk. Um, from my point of view, the uh, vaccine-associated um, myocarditis is extremely rare, something in the tens, maybe 20 in a million. And um, so that, you know, is kind of on the order of risks of, you know, getting in a car, um, you know, being struck by lightning. It's, it's kind of, you know, in, in that range of risk. But then also importantly is how, um, mild of a myocarditis that it, it has turned out to be in the cases of vaccine associated um, disease. And maybe um, Dr. Wasserman can even tell us about um, her experience because we have seen cases of the vaccine associated myocarditis in our ICUs. Um, do you want to talk about those? Yeah, and that's um, that's like one of the biggest points. When we, when as an intensivist, when we hear myocarditis, you know, the hair stands up on the back of our neck. We think of this, um, this process, it's usually induced by a viral infection that causes inflammation of the heart and in its worst cases can have a complete like loss of heart function, essentially requiring life-sustaining support. And so we are always uh, on edge when someone uses that term. And when, but from what we've seen in, at Cornell, and I, I actually just went back to my colleagues to ask, you know, how many of this, how many cases have we seen? It's on the order of about five cases of this post-vaccine myocarditis. And it's not, that's not a number because it's occurring so often. It's because Cornell is a referral center for the entire city where things are happening out in the city. We're usually the first and sometimes the only ones to know about it. Um, but the, the syndrome that we've seen, we've seen of these five children, it's been kids, usually it's all been males um, within about 48 hours of their vaccination presented with chest pain uh, and with parental awareness of this, um, this, uh, sort of reaction to the vaccine. Um, and on their blood work has shown some evidence of heart, heart inflammation. But for the most part, they, the case has been, they've been uncomfortable, but the cases themselves have been incredibly mild. Um, we've monitored them in the, in the ICU for about 48 hours. 
some re maybe required some Motrin just for the pain. Um, and then we just saw resolution. So it's nothing like the myocarditis that you know, keeps us all awake at night and glad, thankfully. Um, so it's a, a rare entity and one that when it does occur uh, is very, very short-lived and manageable. And I think but, that's an important point for parents to know that the, the virus associated myocarditis is not the same as the vaccine associated. The vaccine associated being extremely mild compared to a virus associated myocarditis. So aside from the myocarditis, are there, you know, we that's what we know about really in the short term. Um, but what about in the long term? In the long term, are there is there reason to believe, and we don't obviously we haven't had this, these vaccines for the long term, but is there a reason to suspect that in the long term that there will be issues? Um, I think in the as we were preparing for this, one parent um, said, and I thought this was brilliant. She said, I just want to know that the vaccine is not doing more than it's supposed to. And and that's what I want to know that also, that that it's going to protect my kid from the virus, and that's it. Is there a reason to suspect that something more might happen, that this might in the long run cause long COVID, might cause um, an autoimmune syndrome? Is there, what, is there anything that you all can sort of uh, inform us on and what to expect in the long term from this vaccination? I'm gonna start. Do you have, Dr. Pascual, do you wanna start? So yes, I can start. So I think that, as I mean, you summarized very well, so far the data looks very good. Of course, uh, the data is short term because uh, this vaccine has been there for a short time. So um, I, as uh, Sally um, um, highlighted during her presentation and, and you as well, um, Emily, I believe that, um, Experiencing the viral infection is always going to bring so many more risks in terms of long term that responding an immune response to a vaccine, which we know is not a replicating virus, which we know is a short lived uh, challenge to the immune system. So rationally and also uh, based on what we are seeing uh, so far, from infected people versus vaccinated people, I think that the risk of developing any uh, long-term immune consequence, adverse immune consequence to the vaccine is really minimal compared to the risk of experiencing the virus. So, um, um, you know, the immune response, there was one question in the panel, the immune response to the vaccine in general is better and, and, and uh, looks like in, in many individuals more long-lived, but these are antibodies that so far are not causing any, any problem, the antibodies that are elicited by the vaccine. So we are not really seeing cases of autoimmunity triggered by, by this vaccine so far that are raising the eyebrows of any expert in autoimmunity. So I, I feel pretty confident that with the data we already have, and knowing the mechanism of action of this vaccine, a non-replicating uh, piece of, of messenger RNA. Uh, from the immunological perspective, I am definitely very confident that um, experiencing the infection is going to be uh, much more risky than, than any risk associated to the vaccine. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, of all the vaccines that have ever been studied, there have not been long-term effects that show up after two months of the vaccine. And these uh, trials have all gone through at least two months and longer, really, because by the time we get the data, it's been many months. Um, and our adolescents and our adults have been vaccinated for over a year. So really, the um, time that you would expect a vaccine effect to happen is, is short term. And uh, like Virginia said, this, the mRNA um, does not last in the body more than um, maybe a few hours, maybe a, a, a day or more. Um, and then it doesn't travel to any other organs other than where it was initially administered in the muscle. So there is no uh, reason why we would expect it to go to um, uh, uh, reproductive organs or, or other organs where it may um, uh, be causing an effect. So I also am very comfortable that um, we know maybe all of the side effects that, that um, our adolescents are gonna see at this point, and we'll be following closely our five to 11 year olds 
um, mostly for what is that risk of myocarditis um, now that they have a lower dose um, being given to them. So I'm gonna to move to some of the questions that the audience has been asking in, in real time. Um, and, and Dr. Pascual sort of touched on this a little bit, but can you talk a little bit about the response from the vaccine versus the uh, response to virus? Yeah, well, I, I already mentioned, and, and of course, uh, Sally has uh, also the data, um, you know, that she showed us in the, in the preclinical models. So the responses in terms of antibodies to the vaccine are truly spectacular. I mean, I, I, I don't think that in the vaccinology world, you know, we have seen before uh, something um, like this. So the, the antibodies, uh, the titers of the antibodies are, are great in, 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 of course, when the recipients are not immunosuppressed, which is the majority of the population. And they're uh, lasting, of course, they, they wane with time. And this is why in certain populations now, um, the booster is, is recommended. Um, but I think the superiority of the antibody response in, in elicited by the vaccine compared to the antibody response and, and also the, the other arms of the immune system that respond to the natural infection, I think that um, vaccine is, is, is the winner. So um, I, 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 I see Sally nodding, so I'm sure she agrees with me agreement that um, all the data is panning out that a uh, the naturally elicited uh, antibodies are not as long lasting or as effective as the vaccine antibodies. So the vaccine is better immunity and protects against the COVID-19 itself, COVID-19 related myocarditis and Miss C, as you pointed out in your presentation, because I know that's a question about, you know, sort of weighing how will the immunity if you just have a natural infection protect my, my child. Um, so another question going back to benefits is that will, in a fully vaccinated, once we're all fully vaccinated, will we still, will masks still be necessary in schools? That, that's a great question and something that we're now able to talk about. We're now able to even think about because the vaccine is about to be available for all of our school age kids. We couldn't even think about it until, you know, this vaccine is available. So now I'm thinking about it. I. Um, I'm, I'm hypothesizing that we will continue to wear masks um, in schools through uh, you know, this year because it will take a while for everyone to get vaccinated. You know, it takes several weeks after your second dose in order to be fully immune. And um, you know, there, will, there will be some time to get, get the um, vaccines into um, all of the children and get the education out to the parents so that they can feel comfortable getting it. Um, however, going forward, um, I think that we can imagine a time in which uh, we don't need that masks if the vaccine rates are very high in our schools. So if we can reach that 80, 90, 100% vaccination rates, there may be um, a chance to let our children be in school without masks. However, the flip side of that is COVID-19 is not the only virus that's circulating in schools. And there are many viruses we don't have vaccines for that circulate in schools. And we saw that our children were so much more healthier last year um, when they mostly uh, weren't in school or were wearing masks and were six feet away uh, from their peers, et cetera, that uh, we, we saw uh, fewer um, viral infections and, um, and the, the side effects of those like asthma attacks um, last winter. And so it does make me think that in, in the winter months where we know we have um, respiratory viruses circulating, there may be um, a need to use masking at certain points uh, at peaks of the flu season and things like that to really protect our children from the most severe disease and keep them as um, healthy as possible. I don't wanna to go to masks. I know it's like a whole other, uh, this could be a whole other hour on masks and the, sort of the benefits outside of COVID of, uh, of masks. Um, so, but I want to get to more of the audience questions. Um, so one person asked if they have, and this goes to dosage, um, they have an 11 year old, should they wait until the 12, their 12th birthday to get the full adult, adult dose? This is a great question. It's something that I um, thought about too, because I have, uh, well, I have a 10 year old, so she'll get the low do lower dose. But if you had an 11 year old whose birthday was around the corner, would you wait until they turn 12, get the higher dose? Would you go ahead and rush out the door and get them the lower dose um, as as an 11 year old? 
It's my opinion and, and, and informed by um, many years of research that because children respond better sometimes to that lower dose of a vaccine compared to a higher dose, I would go ahead and get it. Um, and it's both because of the immune response that we know um, children um, can, can mount to uh, low doses of vaccines, but also because you don't want to wait. You don't want to wait a day, a week, because we have been waiting so long for this vaccine to be available. COVID-19 is still circulating. Uh, it's interrupting our schools. It's causing us to have to go get PCR tests for our children. It's it's still replicating and new variants could become available anytime. And so it, it, I would not wait um, once it becomes available. And even um, immunologically, I wouldn't wait until my child turns 12 to get the higher dose. And then thinking about the timing of, of uh vaccine of getting our kids vaccinated a um, do we need to worry that the vaccine itself will interact with other medications there is not a concern um, at, at this point of any interaction with any medications um, you know there have been uh, this vaccines have been out in adult and adolescent populations for almost a year now there are a lot more medications used in those populations and no interactions have been identified um, the important thing was, can you get more than one vaccine at one time and have, you know, equal responses? And that um, is, is something that actually our immune system is set up to do, to respond to many things at one time. So it actually speaks well to what our immune system is, is designed to do. Um, but also studies have gone forward to show that there is no negative impact on one response to one vaccine or another uh, when they are given together. So that's all good news. And I think now that we, school testing is happening with a lot more frequency, so we know often if our kids have a COVID-19 infection, if, uh, if a parent has a child who has been recently, has recently tested positive or recently had a real illness from COVID-19, how long should they wait to get vaccinated? No official time um, limit to when you will have to wait to get vaccinated. If it um, was my child got infected today and I had the chance to um, think about whether they would get vaccinated in a week. I would go ahead and get the vaccine. Um, I think if they were infected that same day you were meaning to go to get the vaccine, you would wait until temp they would be out of the quarantine time. So until you know that your child is no longer infectious, that also gives a chance for the immune response to come down from that infection. And then I would feel comfortable getting the vaccine after that sort of timing that 10 day to, to um, 10 days ish uh, amount of time after the infection. And do you anticipate that our kids will need boosters? That's an interesting question. And one that I am uh, predicting that children will not need um, as many boosters as frequently as adults because they respond better to these types of vaccines and their immune responses are more durable. And I think eventually we will see this vaccine become a routine vaccination in pediatric vaccine schedules. And there may be uh, one or two doses that are built in like many of our vaccines, but I don't imagine that um, kids will need a booster as frequently as adults. And this will, it will all depend on data and which new variants are coming out and uh, just learning about the durability of these vaccines. Exactly, so I agree with Sally. I am going to uh, add a little bit. Obviously, studies need to be done to determine, and I am also optimistic in this regard, Emily, <laughs> and I uh, agree with, with, uh, with Sally. But we are starting a study uh, to look for the durability of antibody responses in children who are receiving some immunosuppressive medications, and we will be comparing with healthy children. So hopefully this data is going to come up and, and we will be informed. Unfortunately, we're, we're at time, um, and I, I know there are tons of questions in the chat, so a lot of enthusiasm, more enthusiasm um, about learning about the vaccines. Um, I just I want to thank you both tremendously for this talk, um, personally for being my amazing science and professional mentors, um, but also just for providing so much information. I cannot wait to go back and tell everyone who's been harassing me <laughs> about all of the answers to the vaccine questions. Um, and I'm just going to, I think Christina Truesdale is going to take, kind of take over. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was an incredible presentation. Um, thank you, Dr. Permar, for your fascinating talk. 
And thank you, Dr. Pasquale, for joining us to share your insight. We're so lucky and grateful to have such wonderful leaders at Well Cornell Medicine. And your main priority is to make children healthy and safe. So thank you so much. Um, thank you also to Dr. Wasserman for being here. It was wonderful to learn more about your work. And we are very grateful for everything you're doing to advance research for COVID-19. Um, I'd also like to thank quickly everyone for attending today. I hope you found this talk very helpful. I sure did. Um, and to learn more about how you can invo get involved in the Children's Health Council, please write to us at chc at med.cornell.edu. And if you have any other pressing questions, please feel free to reach us, um, to email us, and we will get back to you on any other questions that were missed today. Um, we'd be thrilled to talk to you. Um, thank you all for joining and stay dry and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.